Hey, 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 you guys, Ra Satyad here in Singapore. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, a couple more days and we're done with the year. And um, yeah, I've been thinking about all of my goals, as always. It's been like a whole week of, let's recap, let's go back, you know, let's see what we did this year. And um, there's still so much I need to do. And I'm so, so excited. But um, yeah, I was reading through uh, a book today and I was thinking about the idea of healing, right? People are like, oh yeah, you just need to heal that. You just need to heal this. But a lot of times we don't know what to heal. We don't even know where to start, right? Uh, we don't know that we have daddy issues until we meet a guy and realize that we fall for them for all the wrong reasons. And maybe we're hoping that they will fill a void that maybe our dad left for us or stuff like that, right? Or mommy issues, the same thing. We don't know that we have a problem sharing. I don't know. Let's let's talk kids. It's easier, right? We don't know that we have a problem sharing our toys until we have to share them with somebody and then we, you know, throw a fit or give them, you know, the broken ones or keep certain ones for ourselves. We have issues that way. That's the only way that we know what to heal. But as a kid, I got to say, you have someone around you that would say, "Uh uh-uh, don't do that. You got to do this instead. This is the right way to do things. You can't be selfish. You got to share your toys. You can't hit. You got to speak. Don't use your hands. Like, you know, all those things. Somebody's there to tell us. As adults, it doesn't look like that. No one is objective and standing over you saying, hey, this is not the correct way to do things or there's a better way. No one's there to tell you those things. What we have as adults are triggers. They're awesome. What we have as adults is something that comes in the form of a situation, uh, usually aggravated by a specific person in their personality or a specific place <clears throat> that is no longer comfortable for you. And unfortunately, instead of having someone tell you, hey, there's a better way, hey, you can't do that, hey, you're making it worse, you usually flip out and make things worse and become more uncomfortable and then realize, yeah, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to be there ever again. I don't want to feel this again. I don't want to feel this situation ever again. So the trigger becomes your red flag, hey. This aggravation is, um, will appear, sorry, what is that, what is that quote? I'm trying to quote the, the side view mirrors, right? Objects may appear closer than usual. I don't know. I can't remember. But the point being that the red flag, the trigger is telling you, hey, <clears throat> avoid this or fix it so it does not bother you anymore. And unfortunately, that's where you heal. But we're not taught to heal that. We're taught to avoid it. Just walk away from it. Don't go near there again. This is another another wall you put up so you, you, you close yourself up in a cage. And eventually what will end up happening is you find that the cage is too small, you don't have room to breathe, and you no longer enjoy operating within those walls. Usually that comes in the form of a relationship. Um, you want so badly for the affection of this one person that you put up walls to keep them safe and to keep them close because you don't want to offend them. You don't want to give them any excuse to turn around and walk away. But as you put up those walls, you realize that you're not actually helping yourself. You're helping them, but you're, you know, you're making it worse for yourself. And eventually when you put up enough walls and you find that, you know, the walls are closing in and you don't have enough space to operate anymore, you're going to rebel. You're going to start breaking down everything possible because you need that space. You're suffocating. So then what happens? You break down the walls, you let go of this person, you walk the hell away, and you sit by yourself for a while. Some of you sit by yourself for a while. Some of you get up under a new person. But the bottom line is, you will not understand that this is the process, this is the pattern you've created until you find someone that doesn't operate the way you're used to and you try to paint them with all the colors that you are used to. Yes, in the past and other relationships, certain aspects kept you safe. You didn't sing anymore because then it didn't invite any criticism about how you sing. You don't play loud music in the house anymore because then no one can tell you off for playing loud music and you don't have to feel that rejection and that judgment and that shame. You slowly started dimming your light because it kept those people around you because somewhere along the line you told yourself that you didn't deserve any better than this. This is about as good as it's going to get. You better 
you know, make you made your bed, you better lay in it, all that. Trust me. I'm telling you as a person who has made a bed, has laid in it, has um, overturned the bed, has destroyed the bed, has bought a new bed, has built new beds. These are all metaphorical, of course, and actually literal. I'm an Ikea fanatic. But the point being that you can change your circumstance anytime you wish. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it's possible. I'm not saying it'll be overnight, but you can achieve it. But the beginning of all of that is to realize that you don't have what you want. You're not comfortable where you are. And when you're uncomfortable, it's an opportunity for you to look at where it's uncomfortable. You ever get like, um, you know, goosebumps or no, maybe not goosebumps. Let's, let's think about this. You ever get. Hmm. Okay. You know what? This is a good example. So there is um, a test people do to see how well you respond to a stimulus, like on your, a physical stimulus on your arm. They'll ask you to close your eyes and somebody will touch you very quickly on your arm and you're expected to put your finger exactly where they touched you to see how good, you know, your nerve response is, to see how well you can, how close to that original spot you can come. In life, it's much the same way. When something pokes you or hurts you or upsets you, it is your job then to figure out where it hurt. Not to cover it up with, you know, beautiful language, but to explain exactly where it hurt. And once you can explain where it hurt, you need to explain next why it hurt. Let's take this for example. Uh, I had a really stupid argument with my mom the other day. It was dumb. It was my fault. I got offended for no reason. Then she got offended. We triggered each other. It was awesome. It was a great blowout (laughs) over nothing. Okay, it wasn't nothing. It was over bacon. But the point being that I had been out all day and, you know, there was food in the house and I'm glad that she, you know, she ate, but she was craving some bacon and she bought bacon. Now, lately with all this wedding stuff and buyer's remorse after the wedding, (laughs) I've been reconciling my bills and I've been trying to play it very, very safe with the amount of money I'm spending. Because, you know, getting to the end of the year, waiting for the next paycheck or whatever, and you're trying really hard to make sure that you don't go crazy because you've already had a wedding, you've already had Christmas, you've had all these expenses along the way, and it's just been a big month for me. So I was trying to be careful. And when I got home and she said, yeah, I bought bacon, uh, but there's none of it left. I bought bacon bits for you guys. And I'm looking at the house like, there are other things we need to be buying for the house, and we haven't done that. And I didn't mean for it to come out in any way other than to just be silly. And I said, so you had bacon with rice, huh? And she got mad. Because I, to her, I was insinuating that you only ate bacon with a little bit of rice. I know how you eat. You eat too much. That's the way she took it. That's not the way I meant it. But once she took it that way, her response was, what? I have to run everything by you when I, when I buy stuff? And I was like, no, that's not the case at all. It was taken out of context it was blown out of proportion and both of us were yelling at each other over bacon it didn't even matter it wasn't even a big deal it was like five dollars that we were arguing over but once we argued and we stepped back for a little while and I called my brother to vent (laughs) and then I went back to my mom and I apologized and I said look I've been stressed about money lately and for some reason what you told me upset me And I'm sorry, I did not mean to make it a big deal. But you see what I had to realize? I had to have the blowout. I had to realize that my response upset her and then her response upset me, obviously, you know, tit for tat. And then I went and talked to my brother and he was like, y'all are crazy. And then I sat down for a little bit and I was thinking, I was like, no, but I don't want her to be mad at me. So let me go apologize. So I went to apologize and I told her, hey, this is where it hurt. And this is why it hurt. This is where it hurt was you spent something on money on something that wasn't necessary. And why it hurt is because I'm stressed out over money. Very simple. It's hard to say that out loud to people sometimes. It's hard to admit that, hey, I'm worried about something. I'm scared I didn't do something right. I made a mistake. This is important to me right now because, you know, I'm worried. It's hard to admit those things. But once you admit them, you know exactly what you need to heal. I need to make sure 
that I'm smart about my money all year long instead of binge and then regret and binge and then regret and binge and then regret. Because I left the rat race of corporate Singapore to make sure that I didn't live paycheck to paycheck. But here I am doing it again. And yes, there were extenuating circumstances. There's a wedding and Christmas and all those things. But I found myself in that place that's uncomfortable. And money is a big trigger for me. And I needed to name it. And once I named it, I understood exactly what the problem was. I understood exactly what I needed to do going forward. So I never find myself in that place again. Meaning to say I'm not avoiding that situation. But I'm making preparations in order for it not to be a problem ever again. Let's put this in the context of a relationship, shall we? I'm going to use myself again, you guys, as an example. I have had people, oh my God, hordes of people try to set me up since I came to Singapore as a single mom. I've had numerous conversations with people um, about, you know... um, who I'm eligible to date. I should not be by myself. I'm not capable of taking care of a child and raising a child by myself because women my age should be married. Um, Lots of awesome conversations like that. And so the auntie network went to work and uh, tried to set me up. And along the way, it seemed as though they were only looking at other people in my situation in life, as in I was only eligible to date other divorcees with children. Um, or older, or men older than me. I'm not saying that's not a good thing or a bad thing. I'm saying the way they approached it triggered me. And so when I responded and said, no, I'm not interested. I don't want you to set me up first of all. And then I don't want to be told who I can and can't date. Forget all that noise. Because if I'm going to ever end up dating again, if I ever think about stepping foot in a mandabam to get married again, it's going to be somebody that I actually want to be with, not somebody that somebody else set me up with and I had to settle because that's what I was told I had to do. I'm not doing that shit again. But to them, it sounded like, oh, she's a man hater. Oh, she thinks she's too good to get married. Oh, she has a chip on her shoulder. So it all came out wrong. But I realized that that was a big trigger. But I didn't understand why. So I kept to myself. I've been single for six years. I haven't been seeing anybody. Sure, I talk to everyone. I smile. I laugh. I make jokes. I'm silly. I invite people over to dinner. No big deal. But I'm not dating anyone. And it wasn't until I had the opportunity to even have the conversation about whether or not I would date someone that I realized I had some stuff to heal still. Being single, yes, I had to realize how I could be by myself and not be bothered by all the quiet and all the the space I suddenly had. I mean, think about it. I was married. I had three kids in the house. I had a house. I had a car. I had a husband to take care of, which means every time I went to the grocery store, it was what all would they love to eat? What can I cook to make them, to show them that I love them, that I care about them, that I have them in my, in all my thoughts? What do I do? Where do I go? Who do I interact with? Because I don't want anyone to think that I'm being disloyal or, or sneaky or any of those things when it comes to my family. So when I left and came back to Singapore, suddenly I had all this time and space to think and it took me a while to get used to being by myself again. But it wasn't until I had the opportunity to have that conversation about possibly dating someone that I realized there's a whole other side of this thing that I hadn't even resolved yet. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can effectively create space for another person in my life. I don't know if I can avoid making the same mistakes I made in my marriage with a new person. Meaning to say that when I'm with you, I'm all in. Balls to the wall, all in, meaning I am all about you. And my biggest problem was being all about you meant that I forgot about me. And if anything were to happen, I'd be stuck picking up the pieces and recreating my life again. So that was something I had to reconcile. Still have to reconcile. It's, it's kind of hard to do it by yourself. But I didn't know it was there until I had that conversation. I had a Justice of the Peace wedding in 2008. I had a Sri Lankan style Indian wedding in 2009. And all of those things that that meant, like it meant 
come on, let's be real, right? Girls, y'all start fantasizing about marriages when you start watching Tamil movies at a young, young age. Oh my gosh, it'll be like this and they'll be like that. And the people will be happy and blah, blah, blah. Like all, all the details, all the details. And as much as I fantasize as well, I didn't have all the details, but I had the feeling of what I wanted a marriage to look like. What I wanted the wedding to feel like. Unfortunately, I had no say over my wedding. Uh, my aunts took over and that was sweet of them. Um, but that also meant that they were doing it for themselves more than they were doing it for me, which is fine, whatever, okay, it, it was done. But that whole munumurichu, manja kairu, minji porudu, like all of those little, little things, to put a potto every day, to wear your thali under your clothes every day, all those things meant something to me, and I married someone outside of my culture who had no idea what that shit meant. And so when he disrespected my culture, because he was... <laughs> He was not an, not at all interested in the fact that there were, you know, meanings behind all of those things. So he never asked. And I never told him. But when you when I look back at my marriage and the way he treated me and the way he did things, it was never about us. It was about him and his kids. It was always about him and his kids even though I took care of I took care of us. I held us together. I built that home. I created it out of nothing. So when he pawned my thali, he didn't understand the meaning of what he did. And so now when I think about possibly dating someone, and you know, look at me at my age, look at my station in life, I'm a single mom. I'm not dating you for the hell of it. If I'm dating you, there's going to be some kind of a purpose. We're going to have like an end game here, which is a, usually marriage. But I'm also thinking, do I want to stick my neck out literally? For someone else to tie a yellow cord around my neck to have it end up the same way. Am I ready for that again? Even if I could find someone in the same culture who respected the same traditions, would they want that? What does marriage look like now for me? Would it be more like, you know, Kirk Douglas and Melanie Griffith? Would it be more like Jada and Will Smith? I don't know. And if I marry someone, would that be someone who's already divorced or someone who is my age or someone who's younger or someone who, I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. I have no idea, but I need to be ready for all of those possibilities. I need to reconcile those things for myself. Am I ready to be questioned by the public, by my family, by their family, whoever the person is, about whatever it is that we got going on? Or can we effectively smile at everyone and say, we got this, don't you worry about us, we're going to do it our way, and it'll be all right. It's more than just about setting boundaries about how you want to be spoken to or how you want to be loved. It's also about the melding of cultures and your beliefs on marriage and my beliefs on marriage and do you want more kids or are you okay with being around my child and taking care of her as if she were a part of you? There are so many things to reconcile. And as much as I've healed over the breakup that was my marriage, I don't know that I've healed enough to get into another relationship. I know who I am in a relationship. I'm not girlfriend. I'm wife. It's just who I am. I've always been the wife. And whether that's the title or not, that's just the way I behave. If I'm with you, I'm with you. As in, I take you everywhere I go. And not physically, you know, I take the idea of you everywhere I go. As in, I will not do anything to disrespect my family. I will not do anything to embarrass my family. I will not do anything to put you in harm's way or have anyone have the right to speak about you negatively. That's who I am. So there's a lot still to reconcile and I didn't know I needed to heal all those things until I was triggered into a conversation about whether or not I wanted a date. And at the time, to be very clear, I wanted to date exclusively. But looking back at it now, the way that it turned out, I'm okay with because I'm not sure that I wouldn't have sabotaged that whole situation because as much as I want a dating situation... I'm not sure I'm quite ready for it still. I'm still healing. I'm still working on it. 
I've told you about this before. When you get into a new situation, it should be a blank slate. But it's hard because you're already jaded by your beliefs on what has happened, what you have seen before. And so because this is a new situation, you don't know what the outcome is going to be, you tend to act in ways that recreate what you do know. Self-sabotage. Let's say you've dated a couple people and all of them have turned out to be jerks. Maybe they only wanted you for your body. And while you thought that was affection and that was love, it wasn't. And eventually you felt small and used and dirty, but you were found a way, a way to come out of those situations. You came out of those relationships. I've had many women come to me and ask me, hey, I've been, in, I've been there. I understand what that feels like. And I can't seem to understand why I keep attracting unavailable men. If you understand the law of attraction, you're under, you're, you are attracting who you are. As the, that's what they say, right? But let's think about that. I'm attracting unavailable men, meaning to say what? That I'm unavailable? Perhaps. I know in my case, I show up as this person who doesn't need anybody. I can do it all by myself. I've done it. Anything I can do, I'm sorry, anything you can do, I can do better. And so who wants to be around that? What else can I offer besides a physical connection? If you don't need me and I don't need you, what else is there? So I attract unavailable men because I myself am unavailable. I am afraid to open up. I am afraid to show that I can be vulnerable and I can teach you about myself and trust that you're not going to use it against me. This is why we had the vulnerability class, and this is why Chantel recently had a boundaries class, a consent class, I'm sorry, with a, with a bonus on boundaries. It's harsh to say that you attract who you are, because then you're like, oh, but I'm not like that. You may not be like that, but is that what the world sees is the question. So you see, your triggers show you where you need to heal still. I had a young lady I was speaking to, and she seems to get very perturbed and upset very quickly about her newly melded family. And I felt badly for her because it's a lot of change. And by the time we got through the one conversation, I realized she is super angry and triggered easily because she's being told on all fronts that she walked into the family. She's the new person. She's got to be the one to adjust. But that's not the case in a blended family. It's not just her. I was grateful she reached out because I was able to tell her, hey, it's not just you. Yeah, okay, you gained how many people and you got to adjust for how many people. But the point is they gained one more, technically two more because she has a son, but they gained two more people and they need to adjust too. And they need to take you into account too. Everybody adjusts when you blend a family. And that goes for regular marriages, step-parents, step-kids, you know, divorcees, all of them. Anytime two people come together, everybody needs to adjust. My brother has never been married. My sister-in-law has never been married. They come from two different countries, two different worlds. One was super, you know, married to the temple. and The other one were a little more ecumenical and spiritual. When they came together, we all adjusted. I started going to the temple more, which I actually enjoyed because I wanted an excuse to be there anyway. I wanted to learn the customs and the way things are done because I've been away from that for so long and I need that for my daughter. But the other thing is, on the flip side, she had to start to understand what it meant to be spiritual. What it meant to be peaceful and meditative at all times. What it meant to be still when you're in the midst of chaos so you can figure out what you need to do next rather than get carried away and swept up in all the commotion and to make things worse. Your triggers show you me where you need to heal. And it's going to start with an uncomfortable truth that tells you, hey, there's something about you that's attracting this situation over and over. you got to change it or you got to understand it. A lot of times once you understand something, you automatically change. 
when I spoke to this young lady about her stepdaughter and how rude, crude, and socially unattractive the child was being, I had to tell her from the child's point of view, because I've been in that situation before, where I was rebelling because I couldn't find the words to tell them what was going on, she needs to see it as she's fighting you because you're the newest one. You're the easiest target. And she's fighting the rest of the world because she doesn't feel like she fits in anywhere anymore. Everyone has their place, you know. The youngest is usually the easiest to love because they're so young and they're still impressionable and they don't have these set ideas about the world. And the oldest probably is old enough to know better and doesn't really need much guidance. They can take care of themselves. With the middle kid, constantly being compared up or down to the older or younger sibling and has the worst time trying to find their place in the family. Trust me, I know. My brother is a middle child. My stepdaughter was a middle child. She wasn't always. She was the youngest child. And then she became the middle child and then she started acting up. Your triggers show you where you need to heal. And the biggest difficulty for us because we have ego, because we have pride, because we want to think we're pretty damn awesome by ourselves, (laughs) is to ask the question, where does it hurt? And why does it hurt? Once you can name those two things, you know what you need to heal. And maybe you can figure it out by yourself. And maybe you need to have like many conversations for people to help you piece it together. Maybe you find a coach or a therapist that helps you figure it out. But until you can answer those two questions, that trigger will set you off every time. Now, I want to tell you all, I am opening up slots again for one-on-one coaching. The new year means new me, refreshed, ready to get back in the saddle and teach all of you one-on-one or in groups or in classes or, you know, webinars, master classes, whatever the case may be. And I want you to be the best possible version of yourself. I want you to find more peace and joy every day of your life. In every possible nook and cranny of your day, if possible. I said that twice, didn't I? (laughs) Because it's important to me. So if you need help, please DM me. Message me. Let me know. Leave a comment if you'd like. And very shortly, I will have my website back up and running. And it will be in my, uh, my main link in my Instagram bio and here as well. Please reach out. Let me know what you need. And maybe you don't want to work with me one-on-one. Maybe you're not ready to tell me what's going on yet. Maybe you're not ready to be in a group and share in front of a bunch of strangers. Maybe you need a one-on-one class. And honestly, I'm here to serve. So if you find a topic that you really need help on, let me know. And I will do a free class first. And depending on the, you know, the response from people around, I'll make it a course that you can access for a small fee afterwards. I'm here to serve you guys. I want you to know that. So all the best to you in 2020, in a couple of days. And um, yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to start fresh in the new year. It's going to be amazing. I love you. I'll talk to you soon.